So, <clears throat> so thank you for joining the call today. And um, as Gora Hari said, the discussion we will have today is on the subject of divine relationships. And um, there's a few things. Maybe we'll, let's see how many we get through. Um, but just some things we want to read. But actually, what we'll do is we'll begin in a different way. We're going to first talk about a certain concept, a certain idea. Then we're going to read um, one or two verses, and then we'll just take the discussion in this way. So let's start here. So it was quite a few years ago, and I was um, doing some programs at one location. So I was en route to the particular location, and, and I remember I was running it slightly late. The, I, I, was still, I still got there on time, but I was running slightly late to the destination. So in the UK, um, when you travel on the, on the public transport, we have like, we call it underground. In America, they call it the subway. So you have a certain card that you use to, um, to go on the journey. And when you get to your destination, you have to press the card against a sensor. So it's just like a, a device. You have to put your card against the device and then it's meant to open the door so you can leave the, um, the underground or the tube station, the subway. You can leave and then you can carry on in your journey. So I was running slightly late. I got to my destination. I put my card against the sensor in order to, you know, to come out so I could get to the location that I wanted to get to for the program. When I tapped my card against the sensor, nothing happened. So the barriers wouldn't open. I thought this is a little bit odd. So I tapped my card again and again, nothing happened. So I realized, okay, there's something wrong here. I saw one of the people who worked in that vicinity who helps people when they're trying to um, travel on the underground. So I asked the person for help and, and I said something to them. I showed them my card and I said to them, my card is not working. And the first thing they said to me is that they said, you're wrong. That was the first thing they said without saying, without even, you know, looking at my card or anything like that. I said, my card, it doesn't seem to be working. They immediately said, no, you've got it wrong. And then they pointed out, they said, the, the, the exit that you are trying to leave, the sensor on the exit is not working. They said, your card is fine. It's the sensor which is not working. If you go to another exit and tap your card against that, that sensor, you'll immediately be able to come out. So the, the misperception was mine. Uh, there was a situation, something wasn't quite working. I came to one conclusion and then having spoken to the person, they clarified, no, it's not working, but the reason why it's not working is different to the reason that you feel. Okay, so you just need to do this in, diff in a different way and, and you immediately will move forward. In, um, uh, it was a few years ago now, there was a whole scandal um, regarding social, like one social media platform and it was regarding the fact that they'd been able, or a particular organization had been able to manipulate people by doing two things. One, by understanding the personality of you know, vast numbers of people, just by looking at how they used social media. So by getting data on people's use of social media, this organization had been able to um, literally read the psychology of millions of people. That was the first step. Having read the psychology of millions of people, they'd been able to understand how a person functions, what motivates them, what demotivates them. And then what they'd done is they'd sent different people, different advertisements, political advertisements. And the adverts were specifically designed 
for that particular type of personality. They knew just how to present an argument, how to present an idea so that it would cause the particular individual to be persuaded to act a certain way. What they deliberately, what they distinctly used was a model of personality. And this model is called the big five personality traits. And it classifies people according to these five personality traits and it helps people to understand how they function, what they need, et cetera, et cetera. So they had done this and it was really based upon a very simple idea. They knew that different people would lean in a particular direction politically just by their personality type. And, and, these, and those leanings could be adjusted or manipulated in a certain way. So the people who were on the receiving end of the adverts, even though they were being manipulated in their own mind, they would have surely believed that whatever decision that, that they, they would be making politically had been their own decision, okay? So they would have thought, well, I'm looking at the information, I'm looking at the facts, I'm weighing it up, I'm evaluating it, and I'm coming to my own independent objective conclusion. But again, they would have been wrong. They would not have seen that you're seeing the situation, yes, but you're not understanding the situation properly. There are certain things which are being assumed. So that's the second example. Uh, let's give one more example. Oftentimes when people have a, have a debate around religion or belief in God, one of, the, one of the strongest arguments in people's minds, not necessarily a strong argument objectively, but one argument that people often have is if, if there is a God and if he is good, then why are people suffering in the material world? And of course, one of the key things that we understand very early on when we, when we connect to Krishna consciousness, when we st start to hear, understand and learn the philosophy, is that the material world is not our home. So when people make this argument, well, if there's a God and if he's good, then why are people suffering? I see people suffering. Why? Then there, there's an underlying assumption that takes place. So it's very powerful sometimes to look at what is assumed. So in all of these situations, whether I put my card against a sensor and I'm assuming that the card is wrong, that the card is broken, or um, people are making voting decisions and they're assuming that they're looking at the facts objectively, not that they have a certain personality that biases or leans them in a certain direction. And someone is showing them specific information that's causing them to lean in a certain direction. Or in the case that there's an argument about the existence of God and someone is saying, well, it, it, you know, there's, you know, there's, there's suffering in the material world that proves that they can't be a God, but the assumption is that the material world is our home. The assumption is that we're meant to be here, we're meant to be happy here. All of these things are underlying assumptions. And of course, within our tradition, within our tradition, we know that this material world is actually literally the prison house. So if someone was in a prison and you know they, they call the guard over, um, guard, I, I think there seems to be something a little bit wrong with my room. Um, you know, over the last few days, I've been trying to open the door. I've been trying to you know, walk around the place and the door seems to be jammed. I, I, it's, it's, there's something strange here. I can't seem to just walk in and out of the cell at my own will. And then the guard has to point out to the individual, um, that's not a, a floor, that's, it's designed like that. The expectation that you can walk in and out is, an, is the wrong expectation because you're not in a free open environment you're actually in a prison. It's designed to keep you trapped. So all of these things, we call them in the, in the external world, they use a term, they call it attribution error. 
attribution error. So it's, it's a form of a, an unconscious assumption that we, that we bring, and we bring it to everything, by the way. In any situation, there are some things that we automatically assume. We, we take it for granted and we don't necessarily test those assumptions. Now, the reason why I'm sharing this is because we're now gonna look at how this relates and plays out in the interactions and the associations that we have with devotees. Actually, before I do that, I'll give one other way. I'll give one other way in which this plays out. So I was speaking to one devotee, it was, it was recently, we were in communication and they were asking about this statement in the, in the scripture. So we've been talking about, you know, different natures, etc. There's some questions about that. And then they mentioned, but they said, but, um, but, but Buddha Bhavna, um, in the scripture, we hear Kalo Shudra Sambhava. So in Kali Yuga, everyone is a Shudra or less. Directly, it is, it is a statement in the scripture. So doesn't that mean that actually there is only the Shudra Varna in Kali Yuga? And so I went on to explain, and again, attribution error, or let's say, a certain assumption and this is an assumption that we tend to make especially when we are in our early stages of, of spiritual life or our early stages of just really cultivating and deepening our understanding of knowledge so i explained that actually in scripture there are many things which are explained or defined in more than one way so i was explaining that the word shudra has different connotations or meanings at least three different ways that the word shudra is used in our scripture. So for example, um, Prabhupada in one place, he will say that if the parents did not do garba dan samskar, then the child born of those parents is shudra from that definition. So one definition is that if the garba dan samskar hasn't been done, then, the, then the, the child born of that particular union is shudra from the from the procreation perspective it this is separate from varna but it's just one way in which the word shudra is used so that's one definition i explained there's another place in which Prabhupada says one who is economically dependent so when one is employed by another person so you work for another person they are paying you a salary or a wage so from the economic point of view if someone works for another person is economically dependent upon another person then that is another way in which they're described as shudra meaning that there's economic dependence and then the other way is the more uh, widely understood way which whereas one has a certain psychophysical nature so i was explaining that when we look at scripture there are many things like that where the same word has more than one definition and what was the assumption? The assumption was, I've read this statement, therefore this is the definition. The assumption is that this, is, this definition is exclusive. Whereas in reality, there are sometimes the same word, even, I was looking at this the other day, even our acharyas will sometimes classify the different stages of progression and the symptoms of those different stages in a different way. Right? Even sometimes in our scripture, certain pastimes of the Lord will be explained in slightly different ways as well. So this is a very, very broad, very beautiful, very brilliant, but also very, very deep and esoteric teaching. And there are many different angles to it. So when we look at this, all of these situations have this in common. This idea, the attribution error. error. So I've assumed something that is not quite the truth of a situation. So I'm involved in the situation, I'm interacting with a situation, but I've misread or misconstrued exactly what is happening. Now I wanna bring this lens to our relationships as devotees. And I wanna draw a particular understanding about so something that is really crucial 
that we're not also always so aware of, but which is a fundamental and very key aspect of what is happening as we associate with each other as devotees. So I'm going to begin by reading something to you. And this is from the Chaitanya Charitamrita. Okay, so as a famous verse, and many of you, or well, some of you may know it. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu explains, Krishna Bhakti, Janma Mula, Haya Sadhu Sangha, Krishna Prema, Janme Teno, Puna Mukya Anga. Translation, the root cause of devotional service to Lord Krishna is association with advanced devotees. Even when one's dormant love for Krishna awakens, association with devotees is still most essential. I'll read this one more time because I really want us to tune into what Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself is saying here. The root cause, okay, so not just a, a factor, but the root cause of devotional service to Lord Krishna is association with advanced devotees. Even when one's dormant love for Krishna awakens, association with devotees is still, and he uses the word, most essential. Now, this is really crucial. We, we know, for example, from the Damodar Leela and the commentary by Vishnu of Chakravali Thakur, he's explaining that when Mavi Yashoda was trying to bind Krishna with rope, we know that those two elements of rope were, there was two parts, let's say two, they were, they were two parts too short. And we know that those two parts, those two units, which the rope was always short by, represents two things. Represents effort, so our own effort, our own determination, and it also represents mercy. Vishnath Chakravali Thakur also goes on to explain in another literature, Madhuri Kadambini, about this mercy. He will explain how Krishna gives literally his mercy to his devotees who are then to distribute his mercy on his behalf. Now he also goes on to explain that the devotee's partiality is not to be considered a fault. So I want you to imagine or consider three things. We have a vehicle and we have a destination. Okay. And this is from the Bhagavatam. And in this particular verse, or actually not just verse, but also the purple, Prabhupada makes a point which really is quite extraordinary in terms of its importance and its meaning. And when I, when I first came across this, it was really, um, it was really an eye opener because it really helped us to, me to understand how these two elements come together. So I'll just read this from the eighth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, chapter 15, text number 28. So um, this is the pastime where um, Bali Maharaj is in ascendance. He's, he's able to fight very, very you know, powerfully and to defeat the opposition. And so this is the purple by Prabhupada. So Prabhupada says, actually, let's do it even better. Let's do it another way. I'm going to try and give you a bit more context by giving you the verse as well. So 815.28. We'll read the verse first, and then we'll go into the purple. So this is the verse. Rahaspati, the spiritual master of the demigods, said, O oh, Indra, I know the cause of your enemies becoming so powerful. So Indra is trying to understand how is it that Bali Maharaj is such a powerful um, opposition to him. The Brahmana descendants of Brigumuni, 
being pleased by Bali Maharaj, their disciple, endowed him with such extraordinary power. Okay, and I'm going to read part of the, I um, actually will read all the purple. Prabhupada writes as follows. Brahaspati, the spiritual master of the demigods, informed Indra, ordinarily, Bali and his forces could not achieve such strength. And I'm going to pause here because this is very crucial. So there is, there is the individual's own quality. Right? And that's what's being alluded to first. Ordinarily, Bali, you know, he couldn't really be so powerful, could not achieve such strength, Prabhupada says. Then he goes on to say, but it appears that the Brahmana descendants of Brigu Muni being pleased with Bali Maharaj, endowed them with, his, with this spiritual power. In other words, Brahaspati informed Indra that Bali Maharaj's prowess was not his own, but that of his exalted guru, Sukracharya. Then Prabhupada goes on to explain the following. We sing in our daily prayers, Yasya Prasadat, Bhagavat Prasado, Yasya Prasadan, Nagati Kutopi. By the pleasure of the spiritual master, one can get extraordinary power, especially in spiritual advancement. Okay. I'm going to pause there before I read the rest. So we're hearing that the blessing of the spiritual master are important. We also superimpose that against what is being stated by Vishnath Chakravali Thakur. So there is effort, there is also mercy. So for many of us in devotional life, we work or we work with a certain misconception. And that misconception, to be honest, is the misconception that our progress is really because of us. We work on the idea that, you know, we're doing really well in spiritual life. You know, I, you know, we're doing well in our preaching. I've got some new techniques. So I, I, we strategize really well. And all of these things are allowing us to be really effective and really successful. Now, of course, strategy must be there. Moving forward must be there. Endeavor must be there. But the question may come up, how much of our success is due to us? How much of our success is a gift that is given to us? How do these elements come together and what exactly is going on? And, and we want to explore this because it directly relates to this idea of divine relationships. Why relationships are, in spiritual life are so important and what exactly is happening in such hopefully devotional Vaishnava loving exchanges. So let me read on in this purple. So, Prabhupada then writes in the same purple, 8, 15, 28. He says, the blessings of the spiritual master are more powerful than one's personal endeavor for such advancement. Naratam Das Thakur therefore says, Guru Mukha Padma Vakya, Chichete Kariya Aikya, Ana Kariya Mane Asha. Especially for spiritual advancement, one should carry out the bona fide order of the spiritual master. By the Parampara system, one can thus be endowed with the original spiritual power coming from the Supreme Personality of God at Evam Parampara Praptam, Imam Rajasayo Vidu. He says the blessings of the spiritual master are more important than one's own endeavor. So sometimes, and this is where sometimes the pride can come in. Sometimes an individual, sometimes we are doing well. And we've come to the wrong conclusion about why. Again, attribution error. So I'm engaging in devotional service. I'm desiring certain things in service. I'm desiring to make advancement. I find that there's, I'm receiving reciprocation and I, and I assume, wow, that I must be, I must be pretty advanced. I must, you know, I must be doing quite well. But what's not understood is it's not necessarily very much to do with our own determination. It actually 
has a lot more to do with the mercy of pure devotees, the mercy of devotees in, in general, because all devotees carry some ability to bless others. But those abilities to bless others are different according to the level of advancement of the devotee. Let me just read a one or two statements by Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati Thakur, and then we will take this even further. I wanted to find a particular statement where he touches upon two different elements, which I think are really crucial for us to understand in this particular, um, in this particular regard. So let's find this first one. So bear with me one second. I just want to find this this particular statement. Let's start with number 15. So, this is principle number 15. An intimate devotee does not have any other desire besides serving the followers of Sri Rupa Goswami. So, the desire in terms of serving the followers of Sri Rupa Goswami, that means serving, interacting, relating to the devotees, to the Vaishnavas. So, we touched upon this idea that our progress is largely gifted to us. So how does this process work specifically? So there are, there are at least two factors. First of all, there is our determination as a devotee. So in our determination to practice Krishna consciousness, to associate in the, um, with the devotees, to try to practice offenselessly, all of these different areas constitute the determination of a devotee. And as we apply the teachings properly, as we hear properly, we want to fine tune our devotional endeavor. Okay, so that's our personal endeavor. But that personal endeavor is combined with the mercy of the spiritual master and the mercy of the devotees in general. Now, when these two combinations come together, something incredible happens. So, We've all seen in spiritual life that we may be in a situation where we, we needed some guidance, we needed an answer, we, we, we had a challenge. And as we engage in our practice, as we tried with determination, we were able to move forward successfully through those challenges. or We were able to receive some guidance. What was actually happening is we were receiving some reciprocation from Krishna. But what, what invoked that reciprocation? So on the one hand, we were trying to be Krishna conscious. We were making that effort. But even more significant than our endeavor, as Prabhupada said, is that endeavor was combined with the mercy of Guru, the mercy of Vaishnavas. And that combination of our own effort with the mercy of Guru and Vaishnavas has a certain it has a certain outcome what it does is it makes krishna more responsive to the devotees spiritual desires so when we have the mercy and the blessings of the devotees and we make an endeavor the two things together actually cause krishna to be more inclined and more quick to respond to the spiritual desires of that particular devotee. And, it's, and it is that combination, the combination of having the determination to drive, plus even more significant, 
having the fuel in the car. The mercy of the devotees is the fuel in the car that drives the vehicle of bhakti. And as we are receiving that fuel, it is actually that fuel which allows us to make that journey and to reach that destination that we call love of Godhead. Because of attribution error, the tendency in our neophyte state is to give more significance to our self and minimize the significance of others. And for that reason, we don't really see and understand exactly what is going on in the devotional process. We don't realize how, how much of our advancement is a gift from others and how little of it, even the successes in our preaching, how little of it is actually, is actually anything to do with us. In Kali Yuga, unfortunately, the, the, one, the one real qualification that many people, that we should realize within our own lives is that we are unqualified. Uh, this, um, this statement, Patita Pavana Hetu Tava Avatar, Mosimo Patita Prabhu Napai Bayar. Patita Pavana Hetu Tava Avatar. You, you've cut your Patita Pavana. You are the deliverer of the most fallen. So this prayer that we recite, recognizing that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he's come to pick up those people who are furthest away from Krishna. Mosimo Patita Prabhu Napai Bayara. You will not find anyone more fallen than me. Therefore, my claim is first. Unfortunately, in Kali Yuga, in Kali Yuga, everything diminishes. So it's, it is said in the scripture that duration of life goes down. Intelligence goes down. Good qualities go down. Everything else, everything in Kali Yuga diminishes relative to previous ages except one thing in this age of kali the one thing that actually increases while everything decreases is false ego the false ego is the one thing that always goes up the idea that i'm great i'm special and the misunderstanding that that literally the majority of my advancement is actually being gifted to me by the association of the devotees. And it is for that reason that the relationship that we have with devotees becomes so absolutely essential because we are literally moving ourselves forward by what we are receiving from others due to having the right approach, the right orientation, the right mentality towards the devotees that we associate with. And this, this association, this association is something that we often misunderstand for a number of reasons. I remember, I remember hearing as one, one Prabhupada disciple, oh, you know, get into names at this occasion, but he was talking about how how he and his god brothers sometimes they they disagree very strongly. So the senior devotee was explaining this. So he was explaining how sometimes he and the, the, his actually a particular god brother, he said, "This person and I, we we can hardly agree on anything." So he was making that particular comment to me, but then he went on to say something else. He said. But I respect him like anything because I respect how it takes different types of generals to win a war. And, and I was just reflecting on this. I was reflecting on this idea that especially when we are more mature as devotees, then we can understand and appreciate how different devotees, because of their different conditioning, 
but also because of their different commission, their different responsibility, their different journey to Krishna. We're all reaching the same de destination, but we're reaching from different location points. So when we are, when we, and we're not there yet as a, as a society, but a society in which we are largely a Madhyam society, when we get to the stage where the entire movement is largely on the Madhyam or intermediate devo devotional level, then you'll see much more of this really healthy, mature devotional dealing. So he was explaining like that. He said, I respect him like anything because I respect how it takes different types of generals to win a war. Now, I just want us to, to pause for a moment and really tune into this. So we, we come to Krishna consciousness. Many of us, some are born in the movement. Some come from a particular background. Some come at, at a particular age. We come and we all have our unique, unique journey towards Krishna. But that journey does not begin, in most cases, within this lifetime alone. We all have a certain background, and that background is reverberating within our subtle body. For example, there are some devotees in their previous life, they had a particular um, way of engaging in the association of devotees. They have a particular way of dealing with the devotees in a previous life. I remember one friend of mine, he told me that he'd been, it had been pointed out to him that in his previous life, he had been offensive to his spiritual master. So he was warned that in this lifetime, because you had that tendency in a previous life, you have to be especially careful in your dealings with your guru in this life. Because there's still that subtle, in the subtle body, there's still that, that potential issue. So we can have one devotee, that was one particular area of weakness. You can take it even further. We can say that there was a particular devotee who in their previous life, the reason they did not go back to Godhead, for example, is that in their previous life as a practicing devotee, they were too liberal too liberal it was like they, they they were not sufficiently strict in their devotional service in their devotional association in their devotional practice so therefore very being too liberal what happened was they allowed certain things to enter into their situation uh, you know being too uh, what is it Prabhupada said about his western disciples he said that they do not have enough fear about maya they're not scared enough of Maya. So this devotee in a previous life, too liberal. And being too liberal, what happened was they were unable to achieve the goal of life. Let's, let's take an example in the Shastra. The example that really reverberates in my mind, uh, Bharat Maharaj. Bah Bharat Maharaj, a king, and he eventually renounces the kingdom. In fact, he will even go to renounce his entire family. To do what? To really just tune in exclusively to the direct practice of Krishna consciousness. And we understand in the scripture that in that, in that complete dedicated devotion, he goes beyond sadhana bhakti. He comes to what we call the sadhya stage because in our scriptures, it explains that both the, the stage of Bhava Bhakti and the stage of Prema Bhakti, both of them are considered to be perfected stages of Krishna consciousness. So we know from the scripture that Bharat Maharaj, he's on the platform of Bhava Bhakti. However, this deer is in need and he gets into this routine of looking after the deer and literally become so absorbed in that that we hear that when he leaves his body in his next life how is he born he's born a deer so from the platform of bhava bhakti a devotional service in ecstatic emotion 
where one is completely in rapture in their devotional service. There are so many symptoms. One of the symptoms explained in the scripture is one cannot even, one cannot bear to even waste even a moment in the service of the Lord. Yeah? And one is also Namagane Sadaruchi. One has extraordinary taste for chanting the names of the Lord. All of these great devotional opulences are being experienced by Bharat Maharaj, but he still becomes attached to a deer. Yeah? What a mistake. And then from being at this extraordinary exalted stage, next life, he's born a deer. But it's interesting also that the life after that, as Jad Bharat, he deliberately keeps himself away from the masses of people because he just wants to become completely realized in devotion. So his previous situation informs something about the way that he chooses to practice devotional life in his next life. So too liberal. We may take another example where we consider the person was too harsh. We may say overly strict, in, in, again, in the wrong way. So Rupa Kaviraj, interestingly enough, again, a personality on the platform of Bhava Bhakti. So what happens? He is giving Srimad Bhagavatam class. The association of Vaishnavas are there. And there is one lady who is also in the class at the back. And that lady's name is Krishna Priya Thakurani. Rupa Kaviraj is giving the class. And he notices that this lady, her lips, her lips are moving. What does that mean? It means that while he's giving the Bhagavatam class, this lady, she's chanting. And he calls her out. How can you be hearing Bhagavatam and chanting at the same time? Which on one level is a fair point. It's a fair question. <laughs> you, you will not go to a Bhagavatam class in any of our temples and just be there with the bead bag in your hand the person's giving the class and you're Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. So it is a fair question, except for the fact that this Krishna Priya Thakurani, she's a pure devotee. And in, and in, the, in the heartbreaking humility of, of all pure devotees, which is literally one of the defining characteristics of pure devotees, their extraordinary humility she very humbly explains that she cannot help herself. The holy name is always vibrating on her lips. At, at this stage, we know, as long as at this stage of devotion, we know from scripture, it is not that they, the, the holy name is, is on their lips, that the Lord is descended, right? He is using them as an instrument. So they are literally being used for the vibration. But Rupa Kaviraj, when he hears this, he does not take the proper mentality towards this particular exalted personality. And as a result, later on, he will fall down. And Rupa Kaviraj, at the platform of Bhava Bhakti, had so many followers. So when he started to fall down, he became a deviant. He started giving um, a deviated form of the philosophy. And not only that, because he was a leader, as he deviated, he actually misled so many other people who followed him. And it is interesting what happened to him eventually. He became a ghost, <laughs> a ghost who haunts people who offend devotees. So two individuals, one was too liberal in the wrong way as well. One was too strict in the wrong way as well. Now we can then bring that to our situation as practicing devotees. It is a fact that in our movement, there are a whole variety of different devotees who also have different leanings. Some people, they lean more towards being more, lib more on the liberal side, okay? And devotional practice and, and the way of expressing devotion, it's not a point, it is a spectrum. Okay, 
there are extremes on the spectrum which go outside of devotion, uh, outside of our genuine devotional philosophy and culture. So there are extremes which go beyond that and they should not be done because then they go outside of the, of the boundary of genuine devotional teachings and practice. But if we don't, if we take away the extremes for a minute, there's still a whole wide range. And therefore you will see bona fide, sincere, well-intentioned devotees on the range of liberal and on the range of strict. Sometimes what can happen in our dealings is if I'm on one end of the spectrum, I may say that those on the other end of the spectrum, they're wrong. They're just wrong. They shouldn't, that's, 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 that the conservatives, it's wrong. Or the liberals, they're wrong. Not necessarily. If we are able to pull back and if we're able to understand the dealings of devotees from a wider perspective, if we're able to consider that different devotees have a different history of devotion in different lifetimes, if we're able cons to consider that they have different conditioning, different natures in this lifetime, then we can consider that different devotees will need to walk a different path in order to come to the same conclusion, in order to come to the same destination of Krishna. So what do I mean by this? So let's say that one devotee in their previous life was too liberal. And they know that that was, they don't even know consciously, but subconsciously. They, they, have, a, they have a certain aversion, a certain, a certain uh, let's say, healthy fear of being too broad. They may not even understand why they feel that way. But within their subtle body, they're carrying this dormant awareness, this remembrance that actually that was the thing that caused you to fall down in a previous life. So therefore, in this lifetime, they just naturally lean towards being very black and white in their devotional practice, in the way that they preach, in the way that they, they practice, the kind of people that they associate with, what they emphasize. And it's coming from a place actually of trying to be as careful as possible so that they can make sure that they achieve the goal of love of Godhead. Now, another devotee from the other end of the spectrum in their previous life, they may have been so harsh, so black and white. There's only one way. There's only one thing to do. They may have been very judgmental of others. And in this life, that tendency may have caused them not, um, not to achieve the goal, not to make advancement. They may have even fallen down and they may have suffered tremendous reversals and repercussions in their previous life as a devotee because of having that attitude. So in this life, they're very careful, very sensitive to anything that comes that, that has that feel of very, very strong, judgmental, black and white Krishna consciousness. It just, it just invokes a natural, oh, okay, I'm, I'm not comfortable in this. I'm not comfortable where this is going. I'm not comfortable with this kind of language, this kind of approach. Because they remember that it was a cause of an issue and their fall down previously. So ladies and gentlemen, in our devotional life, as we deal with different devotees, in the association of devotees, especially that association which Krishna puts into our environment despite, <laughs> despite our best attempts to avoid it. This is something to also look out for. Sometimes Krishna wants you to associate with someone because they have a gift for you. They have something to teach you, something to show you, something in their example. And it's not just devotees, even non-devotees. One of the most exciting things that we can do in our lives is ask ourselves, why is it that I always come across this type of devotee or this type of person? There are no accidents. What am I meant to learn? How am I meant to grow? from that association and sometimes the association is to teach us what we should be doing more of 
sometimes the association is, is, is to show us this is what you should not be doing because this is how it comes across and this is what it leads to. Sometimes the same devotee or even the same non-devotee, by their example, the lessons are, are, are dual. By their example, they're showing us certain things that we should be doing more of. And by their same example, they're, sh they're showing us these are some things that you should definitely not be doing. It is just that magical. But if we are able to approach devotional life in a mature way, Madhyamadikari, the mature mood where it's not all about me. And this is one of the biggest issues. Underneath this immaturity is selfishness. Underneath this immaturity is, is a closed minded myopic or narrow minded view of devotional life. And that view is all based upon or all centered upon the idea that I'm the center. So because I don't find that type of devotional life or that approach to Krishna consciousness exciting, therefore it must be wrong because I don't like it. So because of this Kanishta mentality, where what? Atmavam Manyate Jagat, whereby I see everything in the, in the spiritual realm of Krishna consciousness and I judge everything based upon what pleases me so that particular class i didn't find it inspiring therefore it's a bad class the way that this person engages in devotional service that's not the way i would do it therefore they must be wrong this is this is selfishness selfishness means i still i still have to a very gross degree it's not even subtle to a very gross degree i still have this purush above this idea that I'm the controller, I'm the enjoyer, I am the center. And of course, to the extent that I have that mentality that it's all about me, everything is judged from my perspective. There are two things. One, I cannot see Krishna consciousness properly. I cannot see the devotees properly. And therefore, I cannot deal with the devotees properly. It's interesting. This statement. This Trinada Pisa Nichino Torah Pisa Hishnuna, Amani Namana Dina Kirtaniya Sadahari. One should chant the holy names of the Lord in a humble state of mind, thinking oneself lower than the straw in the street. One should be more tolerant than the, than the tree. One should be devoid of all sense of false prestige, should be ready to offer all respects to others. Ready to offer all respect to others and not to expect any respect for oneself. So if I'm offering all respect to others, the word respect, it, it's derived from a word specto. Specto means literally to see, as in spectacle, right? So when people wear spectacles, they are, they are using some device in order to properly see. So respect means to see, to respect others, means to see others properly. Who are they? Jivara, Srupoy, Krishna, and Nitya Das. They're Nitya Das, they're eternal servants of Krishna. But who else are they? This idea of spec, to see. They are actually, they are the individuals who are, who are putting fuel in, the, in my journey to Krishna. By their being pleased, the fuel comes into the vehicle of bhakti, which allows me to make the journey to prema. So in the improper dealings with devotees, and that is why the, that is why the, the param aparad is Vaishnava aparad. And we can understand this. We can understand this very naturally. So my relationship with my father is direct and indirect. What do I mean by this? We all have a family, okay? Or just, in Kali Yuga, it can even be a bit more intense than that. Let's say generally, we have a family. Generally, we have an experience of family dealings. So, we will have siblings, and we will have our father and our mother. So, we can say that the relationship with our parents is actually direct and it is also indirect. What do I mean by this? First of all, we have pleasant dealings with our parents. 
We build a personal relationship. We, we associate, we exchange love, we serve one another. So that is the direct dealing with the parents. But because the parents also have a bond of love with our brothers and sisters, every time I deal properly with my brothers and sisters, I'm also nourishing the relationship with my parents indirectly. Because my parents are pleased to see how I deal with my brothers and sisters also. So the relationship with the parents is direct. The relationship with the parents is also indirect. Both things strengthen the relationship. Now, we also know that the relationship with the holy name is also direct and indirect. When we sit down to chant the holy names, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. We, we are listening, or we should be listening attentively to the holy name. And we may have a meditation, dear energy of the Lord, dear Lord, please engage me in your devotional service. We, have, we may have the meditation, um, dear Krishna, dear Sri Sri Radha and Krishna, please allow me to love you. We may have the meditation, dear Sri Sri Radha and Krishna, please accept me. The relationship, the direct dealing with the holy name. But we also know that we have an indirect relationship with the holy name. And we know that because if we associate with the devotees properly, then this holy name, who is Krishna, who's more, and who at the same time, Nam is more merciful than Nami, who in the same time is in one sense more merciful than Krishna, the holy name, if we deal with the devotees properly, especially if we engage in the glorification of the devotees rather than the offenses to the devotees, that holy name will manifest more. We will actually receive the holy name in its full state because there are different types of name. The name is classified in different ways. So for example, when we chant at the level of Nishta, oh, so let's go back. When we chant before the level of Nishta, that is called Vaikari Vak. So we're chanting the name, but it's just the external syllables. And that relates to what we call Nam Aparad. When we chant at the level of Nishta, which is the level of the Madhyam Adhikari, then we're chanting the quality of the sound is called Madhyam Avak. You know, and that stage is um, Namabas. And then, of course, at higher stages, we can get to uh, Pasyanti Vak. And then there is Paravak. So it is not the case that all the chanting is the same. There is chanting at the level of the body, Nama Parad, by Karivak. There is chanting at the level of Nishta which is chanting at the, at the level of the mind, which is the uh, Madhyamavak. There is chanting, which is even more advanced, chanting at the level of the intelligence. That chanting, that, that quality of sound, Pasyantivak. And there is the pure chanting, the chanting where the soul is calling out to the Lord. It is actually the soul, the level of chanting that Prabhupada has. The level of chanting of a pure devotee, that quality of sound, that is called Paravak. So the revelation of the holy name, the relationship with the holy name is direct and it is indirect. So there is the chanting, there is also how we deal with the devotees. And again, it draws us back to the point we made earlier about the Kanishta Adhikari versus the Madhyam Adhikari, etc. So we know from the scripture, what does it mean to be the Kanishta? The, one of the defining characteristics of the Kanishta Adhikari. They see the guru. They see, they respect the guru. So someone is a guru. Okay, all respects. They also respect the deity in the temple. Okay, this is Krishna in the deity form. But they do not have proper respect and proper dealings with the devotees. 
That is why they're Kanishta. That is one of the defining characteristics of the Kanishta. So when you see the devotees who don't know how to deal properly, and if we do not how to know how to deal properly with devotees, we should understand we're still at very preliminary stages in spiritual life. And that is why it is so interesting. That is why, what, we, what do we see with the Kanishta Adhikari devotee? They, they, they claim to love Guru. Oh, Guru Maharaj, I, I want to please Guru Maharaj, I want to serve Guru Maharaj. But it's superficial. How do we know it's superficial? Because if someone is a bona fide spiritual master, an advanced Vaishnava, then the teachings come in two forms. The teaching comes by their words, but the teaching comes by their example. The difference between the Kanishta and the Madhyam is the Kanishta catches the external aspect, but the Kanishta does not catch the internal aspect. So the internal, so the external aspect, Guru Maharaj told, actually they, they catch the externals of the external. So the Guru's instruction to them, they catch, okay? But they catch that instruction, which is so crucial, but they, also, but they only catch it externally. So Guru Maharaj told me something, I will do something to please him. But even though Guru Maharaj told me something, he, for example, Guru Maharaj said that we should deal properly with all the Vaishnavas. I only catch it, that instruction to the extent that I deal properly with Guru Maharaj. But he said I should deal properly with all the devotees. But no, I will deal properly with Guru Maharaj because he's a devotee. I just completely ignore the same application of the same instruction as it appeals to everyone else. So Guru Maharaj, oh, he's, he's senior, he's my guru, I will deal with him very nicely. But this Bhakta, why do I need to talk to you? Or this person, I don't, I'm gonna, I'm gonna insult you or I'm gonna look down on you. So I didn't actually follow the guru's instruction properly. It's a myopic application of a proper instruction. So I've heard the instruction, but I've only accepted it in, on a very superficial way, which is why I don't extend the instruction to its full application. That instruction is meant to be applied to everyone, but I apply it only here, only to this guru or to gurus, plural, and everyone else is not important. Another way that we tend to be in this Kanishta mentality is we take the letter of the law, but we don't take the spirit of the law. So every instruction, every dealing also carries a mood. And this is critical for us. This is critical. This is why, this is why we sometimes have difficulties in our devotional communities. And this is also why we sometimes have difficulty spreading the mission. I'm going to touch upon this. It's all about relationship. In our teachings, to be very honest, there are some things in our teachings, some statements in our teachings, which may to the modern person feel a little bit harsh, a little bit jarring. Sometimes people wonder, okay, these things are there. How was it that Prabhupada was still able to attract everyone? And the reason why Prabhupada did this, even though sometimes there are certain statements in our teachings, which may for all, oh, it's, it's a bit strong, isn't it? But the reason that people were able to wholeheartedly accept those teachings is because in the example of Prabhupada, they did not just hear the words, the, the, the letter of the law. In Prabhupada's dynamic and loving example, they were able to also catch the spirit of the law. You see? Now, if a parent, if a parent corrects a child, is that good or is that bad? Sometimes in the modern society, may, people may say, oh, it's bad, it was harsh. Not necessarily. It depends upon the context. And, and this is something that we all understand intuitively. And this is, again, divine dealings. How we experience devotees, how we experience the approach of devotees, how we experience the words of a devotee, good or bad, depends upon the context of the relationship. There's a wonderful statement that I read many years ago. I'm paraphrasing because I, don't, I can't say it word for word, but it's, it was in the pastime of Lord Indra. 
I believe it was in that chapter, if not definitely in Christian book number one, where Prabhupada makes the point that only the father who has love for the child should correct the child. And I thought it's just such, it's such a brilliant point. So when Prabhupada, he would sometimes be very strong with the devotees. I remember we used to serve to Mal Krishnan Raj. We used to go and serve him while he was studying for his PhD in Cambridge. And I remember one time him saying, because, because I'll, I'll be honest, sometimes when I hear devotees speak about Prabhupada, I'm like, mm, really? Is that really the case? You know, because sometimes we, we can be idealistic. But one of the things I really appreciated about Tamal Krishnan Raj, he was very real, very, very truthful. And he, he said, he said it wasn't always easy being around Prabhupada, which makes sense. And that's nothing to do with the quality of Prabhupada. Prabhupada, he is unconditionally exalted, but this person is incredibly strong. And his, his, his intensity of love for Krishna would have definitely have impacted upon the environment and impacted upon others. So sometimes people have a very idealistic, um, let's say, remembrance or expression about pure devotees. But if someone is very pure, their love and their devotion will impose upon the environment and will, sometimes it will disturb our maya. That's what it will do. It will shake us up and push us to move forward. So anyway, we, we experience the exchanges with devotees based upon the context. So Prabhupada, as strong as his statements were sometimes, equally strong or even stronger was his loving dealings. And it would take place externally, but it would also take place subtly. The devotees in the presence of such a pure person, they would even be able to pick up consciously or unconsciously the quality, the quality of his selfless and deep compassion for Prabhupada. I remember I was, I was doing a program. I was doing a program in America and I came across one devotee who's a youth in our movement. And she revealed something to me. It was actually really incredible. She, she, we, we were speaking about a particular class that she'd been to. And she told me, <laughs> so she's this lady, this devotee, she's an empath. So she had this, this particular empathic ability. And she was telling me about a class that she went to. And I could understand from what she was saying that when, when she attended this class, the person who gave the class made some statements which were quite strong. And I felt, and, I, and what I understood was that she didn't necessarily, uh, she, the, the, she was a bit challenged by some of the statements. But what she revealed to me was something very interesting. Because she was an empath, she said to me, I could hear the class from this devotee. And, you know, they were saying some strong things. She said, but, I'm an empath, she said, but I could feel that this person who was giving the class as strong or maybe disturbing, you know, to her. It wasn't that the person said something disturbing, but she found it a little bit like, oh, I'm, I'm being kind of challenged here. She said, but I can feel that this person genuinely cares about me. You know, she, she could feel that the person where the, where, the, where the statements were coming from was a place of genuine care and compassion for the people that were being preached to. She actually revealed that to me. We were, we were sitting down talking. And so I thought that was really in incredible because it wasn't just the letter of the law, let's say, but she was able to understand something about the spirit of the law, where this was coming from. So we come from different places. We have different leanings. We have different places that, we're, that we are taking us a starting point as we make the journey to devotion. And if we are to have proper dealings, it really means if we translate it, it means we have to come to the Madhyam Adhikari platform. That's, that is that if you take it all down together, if you boil it all down, the reason why there are difficulties in our dealings is because as a global society, and even sometimes as individuals and community, we have not properly come to the Madhya Madhikari platform. The more that we do this, the more that we can actually see the devotees properly, deal with the devotees properly, and we will have differences of opinion. 
We will have differences in terms of how we view Krishna consciousness, but that can be okay. As long as it's in, in the bona fide realm of the teaching, we're gonna, we're gonna spread Krishna consciousness by doing what? By preaching the letter of the law, but even more, even more. That letter of the law is, is the words and the teachings, but more powerful is how we embody those words and the teachings. We have to understand that people are so burned out, are so disappointed in their exchanges, whether they're religious or not, that they've forgotten that there is a, there is a Supreme Lord who actually loves them and has care for them. That, that idea that there could be a caring Supreme person who wants what's best for me selflessly, it is so alien and so distant from their, from their experience. So even if we tell people that, it's hard to really accept but what can, what can make it really come to life is if and when and to the degree that they see that embodied in the example of devotees. That means more than the letter of the law is the spirit of the law. More than the words is the devotional culture. Because culture embodies the words, the compassion, the sweetness and how it applies on a moment to moment basis in the exchanges between devotees. Prabhupada says that this ISKCON movement is a cultural movement for the re-spiritualization of the entire world society. He explains this in First Canto Bhagavatam. So the dealings, the divine relationships means the divine culture. That divine culture is experienced as we come more to the Majin platform. So we have to advance. We have to learn to purify the heart so we can deal properly. And we have to deal properly so we can purify the heart. Direct relationship and indirect relationship. All of these things coming together will allow, Krishna, will allow Krishna's pleasure to flood our lives. Will, will, will cause the holy name to be pleased so that the same holy name that we've been chanting will now reveal himself more and more and more. As we move through those different stages of chanting and come to the point as pure devotees where because of how we have received the mercy of the Vaishnavas, through the proper dealings of the Vaishnavas, especially the advanced devotees, especially the advanced devotees, but approaching the, the advanced devotees and taking their teachings deeply, not superficially. So not like the Kanishta Adhikari, not I want to serve Guru, but I, I actually will cheat other people and I'll, I'll take advantage of other people. But, but, I, but, I, but I claim to love Guru while I deliberately fail to follow both the letter of the law of Guru and the spirit of the law. Okay, so we'll stop there and we'll open up for some questions. Thank you so much, Buddha Bhavana Prabhu. I, somehow, I guess everyone was just so absorbed and so, uh, so much in listening mood. I did not receive questions so far, but I had one that was coming in my mind. First of all, wow, you really covered in so many different area. And I like very much what you were calling this attribution error that we actually assume things to be like this or like that and create so many difficulties just because of this, those assumptions that we sometimes do not clarify. I was just wondering after such a lecture, it's clear for everyone, okay, I'm fully dependent from the mercy of the Vaishnava. I should really work carefully on those relationships. I was just wondering, because let's say for myself, still being a Kanishta Adhikari, uh, after one day or two days, I will again be in this same uh, frame of mind and might keep doing these same mistakes. What will be your homework or your, your advices that we can work on to, to progress more into, into solving this, this problem? Because I think we all heard 
millions of lectures about the, the Vaishnava parade, elephant uh, a parade, and but still it's just so difficult to go over that. So if you have like practical application, or maybe what do you do yourself to 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 keep you yourself protected from that? Okay. Uh, well, first of all, I also this is something that I also need to work on. So in speaking about it, one thing I can do is by speaking about it. I can also be more mindful and more careful. So let's start there. So I'm in the same situation. Um, there's a few things. I, I think the first thing is to give a certain credit to all of you on the call and to all devotees. I, I was thinking about this the other day. Every time you hear, every time we hear a class, we're not quite the same. And, and I think it is important to recognize this. It's not that, oh, we've heard it a million times before. No, actually, every time we hear it, even though it may be imperceptible, if, if we have heard sincerely, it will move us even a tiny bit forward. But there's a few things we can do to really accelerate. So the first one is we need to understand its significance. When devotees do not act properly, it has a lot to do with the fact that they don't really understand the significance of something, you know? And because we don't understand the significance of something properly, that's why we don't take it seriously. And, and that's really important. It, it applies to each of us. It applies to the devotees. We don't really understand how rare it is to be a devotee, how rare it is to find someone who has come under the shelter of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And, and this, is, this is really important. Golokera Premadana Harinam Sankirtan. The holy name was being practiced on this earth planet before Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came. He was not the first person to give the 16 syllable Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. However, however, when the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra was chanted before the advent of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, first of all, it wasn't chanted, it wasn't so widespread, it wasn't known so widespreadly. It was known by a few people and the conception that they had of the mantra was different. Prior to the advent of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the few people who had awareness of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra and who were chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, their conception was that by the chanting of this mantra, they would get by Kunta Prema. They would go back home, back to Godhead, but that back to Godhead meant by Kunta. The followers of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the holy name that we've been given, this Maha Mantra we've been given, Golo Kera Premadana Harinam Sankirtan. Naratam Das Thakur has explained what? The treasure, the translation of this verse by Naratam Das Thakur. Golo Kera Prema. Golo Kera Prema. The treasure, Golo Kera Prema Dan. Dan means treasure. The treasure of divine love in Goloka Vrindavan. Harinam Sankirtan has descended in the form of the congregational chanting of the holy names of the Lord. So the same Hare Krishna Maha Mantra that few knew before, now it's been given by Lord Chaitanya, but it's gonna take someone, if we follow in the, in the mood of Prabhupada and our Acharyas, it will take us back to Goloka Vrindavan. So it is extremely rare to have this opportunity. What we've been given is an opportunity that is not even there for Lakshmi Devi. We're being given an opportunity to go back to Goloka Vrindavan. So those people who, who, by the causeless mercy of the Lord and his devotees, even know about this, they are, they are extremely rare individuals and extremely fortunate, extremely valuable people. So again, specto, respect, recognizing who we're dealing with and this and the the exalted rarity of the devotees, it begins there. It begins with, with understanding the value and the significance of every single person who comes to Krishna consciousness. Now, if I have that understanding, everyone is valuable, then something else comes from there. Because in the Shikshashtikam prayers, the first verse by, given by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu outlines what is called the seven excellencies of the holy name those seven benefits of chanting they, that verse and the benefits are meant to instill faith because when you value something you you deal with it properly 
you take it seriously, you, you deal with it carefully because you know this is important, this is valuable. So the truth of the matter is we don't understand the, the significance of the devotees, therefore we don't value the devotees properly and that's the beginning of our problem. That's where it all stems from. I don't respect the devotees properly because I don't understand just how important and significant they are, not just to pleasing Krishna, but to my own advancement. The difference between the instructions in one sense of Krishna and the emphasis of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is with Krishna's instructions, this Savadam and Parichyaja, this is how you will go back to Godhead. Lord Chaitanya's instruction and his mood is, this is how we will go back to Godhead. This key emphasis, Nama Sankirtana Prayer. We're going back to Godhead together. So what does that mean practically? It means that the question is, to the degree that I make Krishna consciousness available, not just in the outside world, but internal, in the devotee community, to that degree, I will also be able to come to Krishna and taste Krishna myself. Prabhupada says the engagement in the Sankirtan Yagya is non-different from enter in, entering into Rasalila. Now this is extraordinary and esoteric. What does it mean? It means the qualification for understanding the most exalted pastimes of the Lord and, and entering into that, that realm of pure love that qualification is the Nam Sankirtan movement and the Nam Sankirtan movement is the collective and cooperative engagement of Krishna consciousness. So if I can't deal with the devotees properly and collectively, I can't go back home back to Godhead. So the first, the first step in us really moving forward is to meditate and, to, and by meditation to realize that, that devotee dealings is not a nice to have. It's essential. The journey does not take place without the fuel, and the fuel does not take place without the friendship. Now, once we've meditated, once the one thing we can do is meditate and understand or realize the significance and the rarity of all devotees so that we value them properly. The next thing we can do is we can approach all dealings between us and devotees in a family model. We should really try and have this mood in our communities. And, and it is tricky because in Kali Yuga, sometimes many people, they never even had healthy family relationships. <laughs> so sometimes when we say family model, people are still like scratching their head. All right, like, what, what does that mean practically? Okay, assume that we grew up in a very, hopefully, hopefully many of us will have had this. If we grew up in functional and loving families, you would sometimes have a disagreement with your brother or sister but you don't reject them. You recognize it's my brother and sister. There's a pact of love. There's a pact, there's a, there's a bond. We're all part of the same family. So when I disagree, we disagree, but we disagree knowing that I'm disagreeing with my friend or family member that I love, who is also trying to engage in Krishna consciousness, who's also trying to make an offering for Srila Prabhupada. What we're meant to do is we're meant to be loving in all circumstances. And, and I mean that we're meant to be unconditionally loving in all circumstances, but without being naive. Without being naive. So therefore, we, we are loving towards everyone. But if we see that in our dealings with, with some devotees, because of the mode of ignorance or passion that they have, because of the immaturity that they have, and they're not, they're unable to deal or reciprocate in a healthy way, then we don't stop loving them, but we recognize, okay, this person or these people are a bit immature. That you know, they're a bit immature, therefore they're a bit immature and they're insecure. So in order to feel good about their devotional life, they have to put they have to try to insult or put down or undermine the other devotees. Okay, they're in the mode of passion and ignorance. They will snap out of it when they become a bit more mature. So I I, I recognize that I still love them but I may deal with them in a more, at a more respectful distance. These devotees, they are devotees, but they have all these misconceptions. And even though they, they're told these misconceptions, they want to hold on to the misconceptions because they want to feel better than other people. Immature, okay. But we also, when we see these devotees, we should think, how can I help? And the best way to help is by our example. Whenever we see devotees, 
who have or be, who behave in ways that we find a bit disturbing, we should look at ourselves first and consider what is it about this behavior that is within me? Because what that will do is it will build empathy. I get too disturbed by other devotees because I lack empathy. So value each other first. Approach everything in a family model. And then whenever we see what we may consider to be uh, an area for improvement in another, I should consider how is that same quality present in me first. First, let me correct myself or recognize I have the same thing in a different way. And that way I will have empathy. So I will approach the devotee as like approaching a mirror. So if I had that same fault, how would I like devotees to help me to improve? Because I am my brother and sister's keeper. So in summary, three things we can do practically. Meditate on how rare the devotees are. Deal with everyone as if you would, you're dealing with a very loving member of your family. Someone in your family that you really love. Treat everyone as a loving member of your family. In other words, treat them in the way that you would treat the person that you love the most. Okay, so meditate on this. Everyone is a devotee and we're dependent and they're valuable. Everyone is a member of my loving devotional family. So my success and failure is also based upon how I deal with them. And therefore, even if I see something that I consider a fault, have empathy. If I'm too disturbed by something that another person does, if, it, if ongoingly I'm too disturbed, it usually indicates that I have something of that same quality within myself and I'm not sufficiently recognizing it. Okay, so we'll stop there.